bro fist to you all. I'm home. I am back from sweet, sweet Germany where I had to spend three weeks covering the most hardcore race to world first that has ever taken place in the history of World of Warcraft. And what a pleasure it was. What an absolute pleasure it was. Not only were we there, and we had to miss a couple of drama times, because of course you would have seen me on that casting couch. Yes, it was the casting couch. Uh, because we also had a free company meeting. Met many, many people from the Crawlers Guild that we have in Final Fantasy XIV, who could travel all that way to Hamburg to spend time with me and my wife and kids and the staff and the casters and all that kind of good stuff. But also that, we had the live letter today for FF14. Which was an experience. First one I've been a ever able to experience now that I have completed Endwalker in terms of its main story. And uh, it was an experience to behold to have them sit and have fun and literally play the game uh, to show you how it goes. I can't imagine some of the wow memes where it's like, hey, let's jump into a battleground and I'll show you how it works. Which is exactly what we got today. It was actually amazing. It was an amazing experience. It was so, so good. And I have done a little summary of uh, stuff about the Race to World First up on YouTube for you guys to have a look at. And uh, we'll have more YouTubes for you now. I'm back in home, in the studio. I'm back here, as long with our brand new displays you can see in the back, which are actually amazing. This is what Chris did while we were in Germany. Check it out, man. <laughs> look at this. For you FF14 fans out there, look at this bad boy. Want some Omerot in your life and some Emmett Selk? How fucking cool is this? This is awesome. Absolutely awesome. Uh, as well as we've got Tataru up on the wall. So we've got a little Rosie the Riveter Tataru to go with it, along with a whole bunch of other ones that uh, Mr. Chris designed for us with his artistic talents while we were away in Germany. So lots of stuff. I really like what Yoshi P does prints out some new gear. Yeah, he does. He does use uh, paper printouts. Which surprised the hell out of me. It's not straight. It's fine. It's close enough. It's fine. It's close enough. It's good. It's good. Me once. Yes. We do have a really good discount with display. And those guys have been awesome to us. So well worth checking out. And a little congratulations to Chris. Because they look fantastic. But that's not why you're here today. It has been three weeks since we have delved into the dirty, twisted minds of online gamers. And the troubles and mistakes they cause in the world. So... Let's kick back. Put your feet up because it's Friday and you can relax. Hmm. Now, judgment may be needed here, my friends. Judgment may be needed. Because I read this title and I go, hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm an accidental scammer. Yeah, get your gavels at the ready, my friends. An accidental scammer. Mm. 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 Sounds reasonable. Maybe he accidentally fell into it, you know? Like, poverty drew him there, and uh, he just turned out to be that way. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Let's have some fun uh, and see what the world has been up to over the last three weeks. Mr. Preacher and your wonderful audience! They're all calling you guilty already. I don't know if you can see this, but they're, they're not impressed. We've only just started, and they're very much not impressed. I started playing World of Warcraft. Oh, we're in WoW World to, uh, to start today. Back in that vanilla, when I moved to Indiana. Oh, we're Team America. And a neighbor and his son played. We had so much fun together. I found a great guild and raided as a resto druid up until Wrath of the Lich King. At the start of Wrath, though, when I was in high school, I had to move overseas to the Philippines due to my dad's work. That sounds military, doesn't it? To the Philippines? The guild was really great and created schedules so people could stay up late or wake up early so I could play with them and made the whole transition a lot better. That's nice. Sadly though, waking up at 4am five days a week to raid was not good. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> and I decided I needed to find something a little more appropriate for my new time zones. That makes sense. 4am raiding? Ew. Ew. Hmm. There was one guild on the server that was based in Malaysia. I reached out to them and they agreed to let me trial in Ulduar in my Resto Druid. I had a mentor that they assigned to me. Drew. He was one of only two people who spoke English in the guild. The rest spoke Mandarin, a language I had no idea what the fuck was going on with. But it did mean that I didn't have to get up at 4am anymore. I figured... The easiest solution to make sure I can raid was to learn Mandarin. <laughs> I 
<laughs> the smart. I mean, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Just learn Mandarin so I can read. All right. Uh, good plan. Good plan. <clears throat> I should note here, I never learned Mandarin. Really? Did you not? I did learn some Mandarin phrases, though. But I'll be honest with you now, preaching audience, the Mandarin fr Oh, what did he learn? Come on, chat. What did he learn? What are the two? He learned two Mandarin phrases. What did he learn? Swears. Um, he learned the phrase, how are you so fucking bad? And don't release you fucking dipshits. So the important ones. Those are the ones that will carry you through most content in World of Warcraft. That's all you need to know. And technically, he kind of did start picking up a new language. So those, those are the important ones that he picked up. So he's good to go. He's good to go. I showed up to my first raid with the guild. And there were two other people trialing alongside myself. I thought this was odd, but wasn't super worried. It's a lot of trials for one raid, but it's all right. We took down the first boss with ease and an item I needed dropped. Now, I can't remember what it was because uh, it was this long ago, but... I remember it being a really, really big upgrade for me. Drew whispered me saying that the guild would use something called GDKP to handle loot. Oh no. I had never heard of GDKP. Oh no. <laughs> but he explained it to me. Essentially, everyone would bid gold on loot. And then at the end of the night, the gold was redistributed back into the guild pot to fund repairs and consumables, etc. Sweet. That sounds like fun. <laughs> I had never, ever heard of this system. But I kind of liked it, you know. It meant I could get the item now. Unlike regular DKP, which fucked trials over. So I was actually pretty happy about this. So I bid back and forth against one of the other trials and a few members of the guild, and I won the item. The same scenario happens on the second boss, and by the third boss, I have run out of money. I mean, literally, I had less than five gold to my name. Of course, during the raid, my tear piece drops. Drew whispers me saying I have to bid on it. It's such a good upgrade, and I'd look stupid if I didn't try and buy it. So I told him, Sorry, mate. I haven't got any gold left. Drew says, Don't worry about it. You're doing so good on your trial. I know you're going to pass this trial. Let me help you out. I'll loan you some gold. And you can pay it back at the end of your trial period. <sighs> okay, I said. I clearly didn't think about it for more than a few minutes. And by the end of my first ever trial with this guild, I owed Drew 50,000 gold. At the time, <laughs> I was so happy because I got quite a lot of loot. But then... <laughs> I went into a full-blown panic. I had never had more than 20,000 gold in my entire life. The next day, I go to my friend, Kane. Who I've been playing with since vanilla. And I tell him what's happened. He's always been like an uncle to me. Having played with him for several years at this point, he laughs at me in team speak and then says the line that I will never forget in my life. Mate, I am going to teach you a very important life lesson today. Don't borrow money you can't afford to pay back. I mean, <laughs> yeah, really. He agreed he will give me 200,000 gold. Some to pay off Drew and some to spend in the meantime, as long as I agreed that I would pay him back in installments on Mondays by 5 p.m. every week. Now, you might think, audience, that I was getting into a bigger and bigger hole. But, I want to be clear on this, 
I told him I'm not very good at making gold. How can I possibly pay back 200,000 gold? Well, it turns out Kane had spent the past expansion or so becoming quite the little goblin and had cornered the inscription market on the server. We worked out an agreement that I would send him a certain quantity of herbs every week until we reached the agreed amount equaling 200,000 gold. In my estimation, I got off easy. I usually spent some time farming every week and I actually found it quite fun. So if I just add a few more hours to that, what harm can it possibly do? All my problems have gone away, my friends. All my problems have gone away. Was I fucking wrong? Any second he saw me online and I wasn't farming, he would fucking whisper me. Every single time. Excuse me, mate. Why are you doing heroic dungeons? Can't get any herbs in there, mate. Why are you PvPing? I've not received my herbs yet. There's no herbs in PvP, you know, mate. Just saying, if you're gonna be online, you should be getting your fucking money paid back. You owe me. One time, I saw him offering people in trade chat a thousand gold each to whisper me, asking where his money was. My chat box was filled for three days straight with messages from randos asking me about money. We had added each other on Facebook a few years prior, which up until this point had seemed harmless enough, right? But he saw me posting photos or changing my Facebook status on friends. He would comment on my posts on Facebook. Better have my money. There's no herbs on Facebook, mate. Now, I think he was joking. And I thought it was hilarious. My parents did not. <laughs> they took notice of these posts that started appearing on my Facebook. And begun interrogating me about it. <laughs> oh my god. Now, of course, as we all know, parents do not understand online gaming at all. And when he said, where's my money... They figured he meant money, real money. So my dad came to me. Who the fuck was this guy? Why is he harassing me? Why do I owe him money? Am I dealing him drugs? After a while, I sat him down and I explained the situation to them. Which my dad called me a fucking moron and grounded me. But I was still allowed to play WoW so I could pay off my debt. I mean... <laughs> That's not... That, so I guess it was a win. <laughs> I mean, that's all right. <laughs> it could be worse. Could be worse. <sighs> Except I came to realize it was worse than being grounded as every second in game I was being hassled by either Kane or by one of his little whisperers. And outside of games, my parents were now starting to hassle me as if, as if as about if I'd paid him back yet or not. Why am I watching TV if I owe some guy money? I remember specifically, and I'm not lying to you, one night we were having pizza, and I went to put oregano on my pizza, and my fucking little sister pipes up, Don't you think you should be saving herbs for Kane? They all thought it was funny. I got up with my pizza, my oregano, went to my room, and started flying around Sholazar Basin, looking for fucking herbs. Outside of farming hell, raiding was going okay, I guess. It was fine. The raid leader was incredibly toxic, screaming over team speak in Mandarin at any mistake made, but I couldn't understand him. <laughs> One instance I remember is wiping on Thorum 25 man hard mode. He screamed through his mic in Mandarin. At me. I recognized the character's name. To which Drew had to translate for me in whispers. Hey. Hey, mate. So just letting you know, um, this is what the raid leader's saying. <clears throat> Why the fuck are you not healing? You're at 80% mana. Do you want us to sit here wiping all night? 
I don't know why you're so fucking broke as you could make a fortune as a personal ass wiper with the skills you're showing tonight. That's what he said. Just letting you know. I mean, he was right. I was at 80% mana because I died right after using Innovate. He didn't care. Outside of that, though, raiding was honestly going fine. It was good. It was good fun. However, after a while, I started to notice that math... Math, you see, my friends? Math showed me something. So showed me something real and true. It's not adding up anymore. Two and two no longer equals four. One night, we had a particularly expensive run, netting nearly 800,000 gold in bids for loot. Mostly from some especially crazy bids by some trials that we got. Yet, we as players weren't getting more than 10,000 a raid. Now I understand that some of the money is being kept for repairs, flasks, food, enchants. But it isn't adding up to near a million gold. I'd also noticed that a vast majority of our trials got to the end of their trial and weren't accepted as members. Despite them being pretty good players. So curious, obviously. I asked Drew. Drew, mate. What's the deal? What's going on here? Something's not right. And after a little bit of prodding, he was obviously a little rumbled and he spilled the beans. Our raid leader, our Mandarin screaming friend, actually had a job in the real world. Working for a gold selling site. Genius. Oh, this is genius. I love this. This is this is just genius. This is genius. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is wonderful. This is the best thing I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> he took the majority of the profits from raid nights and sold the gold for real money. And of course, the officers were getting a cut of the profits to keep bringing in fresh trials to get all their gold. <laughs> Typically, the plan is to take a few trials into a raid with some undergeared alts to boost up the bid prices. The trials pay for the gear, then they get kicked at the end of their trial, out thousands and thousands of gold, and rinse repeat. He explained that was the plan for me, but they had lost one of their healing core. Totally not banned, though, he swore to me. So they decided to make me an actual member because they legitimately did need some healers for this raid. <laughs> Since I was decent and always too broke to take any gear from the trials and not <laughs> influence the economy of the guild, because <laughs> you're so fucking poor. <laughs> You're too poor to cause us a problem. Oh, that's genius. <laughs> I was fucking pissed. I was so mad. I had been farming for months of my life, hours and hours of my day. Also, some guy could sell gold. I was about to quit on the spot and report the guildmaster when he jumped into our TeamSpeak channel. He started speaking in Mandarin and, of course, Drew translated for me. He said, if I ratted on them, he would fuck me up IRL as white people in the Philippines are easy to find. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> That's the rest of Druid. Just, all you do in the Philippines, dudes, is you just go out on the street and you just look for any white guy. Rest of Druid. Easy spot, right? Fucking locked on. Ultra kill. So free, actually. <laughs> but if I kept my mouth shut... If I agreed to not rat them out to Blizzard, he would give me a cut of the profits as long as I also agreed to bring at least one trial a month. They would pay off my debt with Kane, which they all apparently knew about and thought it was fucking hilarious that I'd been farming herbs endlessly. And I thought about it. I decided, okay. I sent him my PayPal and I started looking for trials to scam. <clears throat> All told, in Wrath of the Lich King, oh my god, this is so not worth it. In Wrath of the Lich King, I recruited a grand total of 15 people to be scammed and I made close to 2,000 US dollars. I quit the game in Qatar to focus on school. My family still joke about me and give me shit about herbs anytime I go to season any of my food. And some of you might be surprised to know, Kane and I still play together. What? You play with someone who was out to scam you and made you farm herbs for months? Are you fucking crazy, dude? 
Why? Because you're just as bad as him. That's the reasoning here. You joined in. You got in on the you got in on the action. That's what happened. You got in on the action and you start you turned into what he was as well. I I could tell you now, I'm still broke. I am barely able to buy a WoW token each month. I apologize to anybody I scammed. I hope you enjoyed this little story. I have more from my shenanigans with Kane, but that's for another time. <sighs> I mean, guilty or in okay, yeah, it's guilty, right? Guilty. <sighs> guilty. Abs yeah, I mean that's that's just raw guilt. That's that's guilty. There's no way around that. That's just bad. You're both just as bad as each other. Oh, good? Okay. Good and Athalor. Yeah, Athalor. I always get your name wrong. And bad. Okay. Apparently this one has cringe in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Are you setting your cringe meters? Okay. Set faces to cringe. Are we ready for cringe? Are we ready? <clears throat> are you ready for the cringe? Here we go. Don't they all? I mean, there are different levels of cringe for sure. All right, familiar ghosts. <clears throat> There's a saying where I'm from of haunting melancholy and often too overlooked in meaning. One that I must admit, I never really understood until recently. You can't go home again. What does it mean to be home? What is home? I'm still trying to answer this question. Our story takes place in Final Fantasy XIV. So I apologized in advance if a lot of you tire of stories focused on this game. No, we would like more. Thank you. However, we must start our journey in a different game. English is not my native language, so good luck. We'll be fine. I never really was a social person, always choosing to play video games or read a book over spending time with other kids. Which is why my love for MMOs really took me by surprise. The first MMO I ever tried was an old Korean MMO known as Ragnarok Online. It had been out for 10 years when I discovered it by pure happenstance. I was browsing some forums that I frequented and saw some screenshots of this beautiful game. At the time, I had a strong interest in game design. I had taught myself how to program and was trying to learn how to properly create pixel art. Ragnarok Online had the kind of art I wished to mimic. I didn't really consider what it meant to play an MMO, so I found a download and played the game anyway. It was such a unique experience. I was very young at the time, but everyone I met and played with were old enough to be my parents or even grandparents. The guild I was in only had one person around my age. They were named Good. The guild leader had a daughter one year older than me, and we became friends. It was in this guild that I first learned not to get involved with strangers online. <laughs> It was in this game that I met the very best friend I ever had in a video game, Athlor. She wasn't in my guild. We met because we were trying to kill some, uh, kill the same world bosses in Ragnarok Online. It started as a rivalry, but quickly became a friendship. And we started hunting world bosses together. Athlor was a bit older than me though, but she was so cool. She was everything I wanted to be. If you were to ask me who I wanted to be when I was older, I would say Athlor. We spent every day chatting on Skype and playing other games together. And one day, my guild was showing selfies on the... Oh, here we go. Selfies on the guild forum. Naturally, I didn't think much of showing my own. Now, before I continue, I must make it very clear. If you have children, as I know you do, Mike... Make sure you teach them how to watch out for themselves online. Oh no, where's this going? For every nine sensible, kind people online, there's always one who is a bit iffy. Sadly, there was a little freaker in my guild. A 30-something-year-old man. Oh no. Oh, okay. We're good, aren't we, Bex? We're good? We're good? We're good, Bex? Do we need to call the FBI? Are we good? After seeing my picture... He became a little bit obsessed with me. It started with him giving me items in game, which was weird. I'm max level, like I can farm my own stuff. Why are you handing me this stuff? 
It's good. Okay, Bex gives us the all clear. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> he begins messaging me every day. Then every hour. Then he starts getting angry when I don't respond to him. I know now that he did this to uh, good as well. I told Athlor about it and she recommended that I quit the game completely straight away. <laughs> Jesus fuck. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> Good advice, I suppose. Run. <laughs> Run away. I was sad to let Ragnarok go. MMOs have become such a huge part of my life at this point. My parents didn't mind what I did as long as I made good grades and stayed out of trouble. So I was free to play every day as much as I wanted. So it was hard to let such a big part of my life just disappear. But it wasn't just a case of quit gaming. She had a solution. Another MMO that she had been playing recently just got an expansion. She told me of Heaven's Ward in a game called Final Fantasy XIV. Said she could come and join her there. It's safer there. It's less toxic. And so I did. I wasn't sure how much I'd like it, as the only Final Fantasy games I like are 9, 3, and 12. You're going to get a lot of judgment in the chat right now. But it's an MMO story probably isn't that... Im in an MMO. So the story probably doesn't matter that much, right? <laughs> Thankfully, FF14 was well written, so I had no issues. <laughs> I made myself a male Rogadin. I gave him a very nice beard, and I named him Santa. <laughs> of course you did. Oh, the adventures me and Athlor would go on, exploring every corner of Eorzea. I still remember being extremely upset that I had to level Marauder to 15 to become a Dragoon, only to like it even more than Lancer and become a tank main. We did nearly everything together, even stupid stuff like going to the campsite on the beach at Costa del Sol and sitting by the fire together. Only to be disrupted by people doing the cute courtesan fate and that shellfish one. I do know the one. I do know the one. I remember that quest. <laughs> I do. Stormblood was approaching. Athlor suggested that we should maybe get married in game. For the mount, of course. And be able to quickly teleport to each other. Because after all, we do spend so much of our time together. We could then be explain uh, lazy with exploring the world, lol, she said. I was fine with this. I mean, it's a video game. In-game marriage isn't taken seriously, right? Right? It wasn't very long after we got married in-game that Arthur changed. It was jarring, to be honest with you. I had talked to this girl for literally years at this point. She knew everything about me, and I thought I knew her, but I guess I was wrong. After we got married in game, she took it very, very seriously. I became very possessive over me. If I would join a dungeon group without her, she would get angry. Good had joined FF14 a bit before this, and every time I'd run a dungeon or do something with Good, Athlo started sending me these paragraph andies. <laughs> In Discord. <laughs> you can't call it a paragraph, Andy. <laughs> relatable. It's relatable. It's true roleplay. <laughs> These long paragraph Andys in Discord asking me why I'm ignoring her. She actually made it unbearable to play the game if I wasn't with her. I didn't know what to do. This wasn't like her. Athlo wasn't like this. Athlo was funny, quirky, kind, my best friend. I just uninstalled FF14. I, I uninstalled FF14. That day I had logged in to do my dailies and do some fates. Athlo happened to be in a dungeon when I logged on, so I didn't bother messaging her about what I had planned. Midway through a fate, she just appeared, teleported directly in front of me. And she started spamming me in free company chat. We had made our own free company because I didn't like being invited to insert spam inviter here every five seconds. She was asking me why I had grown to hate her. How I could consider, even consider myself her friend if I was going to treat her like this and not whisper her when, she, when I got online. I don't know if it was something about Ragnarok Online or I finally gained some good sense. But I decided the best strategy, the best way I could avoid dealing with this was to not reply at all. So while she was spamming free company chat, I logged out. 
and uninstalled Final Fantasy fourteen. I mean, it's a play. It works, I guess. I mean, mm, escape. <laughs> Giga chat? No way. No way. I apologize to Good, who didn't quite get what the fuck was going on. Honestly, I told her I don't know either. But we can play other games if you want. But I didn't know how to feel. Athlor had been my literal best friend for years. Years! I was concerned something had happened to her IRL. Was something causing this? Why was she behaving this way? But I didn't bother finding out. Instead, I decided to hope it goes away. And left the situation alone. <clears throat> I am very, very concerned about you. You're not behaving like yourself. But I'm just going to avoid the issue and hope it goes away. About a year later, yes, it was probably about 12 months, I got an email. A direct email from Athlo. She apologized. She told me she'd been going through a lot of the time and she couldn't handle her emotions. So can we be friends again? I couldn't reply straight away. I need to think about it. I spoke to Good. But ultimately... I agreed. She was going through a bad time. She was still my best friend. So, maybe it's fine. And I'll be honest with you guys. I missed her so much. I mean, I really, really missed her. Not the person she turned into. The original Athlo. She tried to get me to play FF14 with her, but I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not going back there. Instead, we played some other games like Monster Hunter and Overwatch when it was still good. And she was herself again. I promise you, we were having fun again. But for me, something fell off. Eventually, she kept asking and kept asking, and she was telling me that Final Fantasy XIV was really good. And so I reinstalled it. February 2021. I hadn't played all of Stormblood or any of Shadowbringers up to that point, so I made a brand new character. In honor of Santa, I made a male Highlander with the Ilbird face and eyebrow tattoos. I named him Chad Santa. Smart. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, nothing wrong with that name. The changes to the game kind of baffled me at first, but I grew to like them. I mean, who likes teleporting or having to level every job to get your skills, right? Well, the answer is I do. I love them. I blame how grindy my first MMO is, but I love grinding it out. I've got a Korean brain rot. Everything was great other than how bloody long the queues were on the data center. It took me three weeks. Three weeks to get into diamond weapon. Normal. And I wanted to die. Please let me finish the story. Me and Athlaw did a lot of fun stuff together, like duoing every possible dungeon that would allow us, allow us to, just, to just be us. We farmed so many pieces of glam and tried to duo the Omega raids. Things were good again. And naturally, at some point, she said... <laughs> Honestly, we should just get married again for the... <laughs> oh, God. Uh, for the convenience factor. <clears throat> you see, you take one baby step and suddenly you've walked a mile... It's all there. I obviously had concerns. But she promised me. She promised me. She promised. It wouldn't be like last time. She could prove it. She could prove it. Instead of us getting properly dressed up for the wedding, we would make chicken glamours. Not the chocobo, but the Easter chicken event. I wore casual shorts with a dark divinity top, claws of the beast, divinity boots, and a big golden chicken head. We were going to do it as chickens to show how light and non-serious this was. And it felt like she came around. She wasn't going to take the wedding seriously. It was for fun and for convenience. After we got married, it began again. She got possessive again. But it wasn't like before this time. It wasn't so pronounced. It was subtle this time. Everything was fine for a bit, but she started to get angry at me on Discord for not being online as much as she felt I should be online. 
but not spending enough online hours alone with her. I told her <laughs> I'm not dating you. Okay? We're friends. I like playing games with you. Why are you saying this crazy shit to me? That is what I wanted to write to her. That's what I felt I should write to her. But she was my friend. So I thought instead, I will be considerate and kind. <laughs> Divorce? Can you even get... I assume you can get divorced in FF14. I've never heard of it, how it works. But it got worse. And it got worse. In a fit of rage, she deleted her character in game, blaming me for ruining her online experience. <laughs> What's the point of a character that's married if I have to play alone? <laughs> I was so confused. So, <laughs> some Endwalker advertisements had already come out at this point, and I was excited for it. So I didn't want to uninstall. So I cut ties with her and transferred my characters to an American server. There I went to play with a Final Fantasy XIV YouTuber I liked. And yes, we became friends. I changed my character into a cute cat girl so I could wear nice fluffy winter clothes. And I had fun for a time, but I'm not in America. It's not me. I noticed a familiar female aura popping up in various places. Where I, oh God, she followed you? It happened so often it couldn't be a coincidence. I at first thought it was my YouTuber friend messing with me. Something for a meme or a video or something. But when I asked them, they had no fucking idea what I was talking about. I decided the next time I saw this aura, I would ask them if I knew them. And lo and behold, it was Athlor. See, on the lodestone, if you save the URL, even if some cha someone changes their name, you still get linked to the same character. And it shows what server they're on and everything. So I deleted the character. <laughs> My second Santa, now with a law-friendly good name. You deleted your character? Why? Why are you so dramatic? I started ever 14 again. A new two Santas down on the same data center with the intention of re-clearing everything. Because if you didn't know, Mike, you get special dialogue if you complete certain quests before certain points in the MSQ. I even met a nice group during re-clearing coils that I thought I'd become uh, static with. But again, she fucking found me. She found me again. I switched to a different server to try there. It's a role-playing data center. Of course, she'd never think to look for me there, but she did. Because of one of those big FF14 discords that everyone joins, she found me. I joined to find groups, but she knew it was me. How do I know she, she knew it was me? But she found me yet again. So I did the only thing I could do. I uninstalled Final Fantasy XIV again. <laughs> you're rookie, man. You're a fucking rookie. You're in public servers and you're trying to escape a stalker? Man. Honestly, a lot of this is you being a noob. Yeah, I'm victim blaming. <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a fucking... I'm going to say it. I'll say it. You're a fucking rookie. Right? You gotta get on the blacklist system. You, yeah, exactly. Just blacklist them. See, look at the pros in chat. Look at these guys here. These guys would never fall for this shit. These guys would never fall for this shit. They're all over it, man. They know what's going on. These guys have all run from stalkers. Everyone in the chat right here has had somebody stalking them and has managed to escape from it. You know what I mean? These guys are old school. Pay attention. This time, I stayed literally off internet gaming for five months. Racking my brain, tried to figure out how my friend of so many years, how she could become the person I'm running from. How could it happen? What did I do? Did I lead her on? Did I do something wrong? Why was this happening? And fuck me, I want to play Endwalker. <laughs> I've got to figure this all out before Endwalker comes out. Hmm. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to play Endwalker. So, like, I need to crack on with this. <laughs> Playing on the American data center really ended up being a benefit as I was always on before the super Q died. I was so excited to see the conclusion to the story that I had played for seven years now. The one with so many memories, good and bad. But it felt hollow. I felt empty. Something was missing. When I got to that part, not elaborating because spoilers, but chat knows what I mean. As I walked forward, I know the part. I remembered all the times I had had with Athlor. The song that was playing... It hit me so hard with those memories. And I cried. 
not just because of the game, but everything I saw as I walked that path reminded me of a friendship lost, of what should have been, what was ruined by foolish obsession. I realized in that moment there was nothing I could have done. Sometimes friendships don't work out, and I found myself wanting to reach out to her once more, to talk to her once more, to try and fix things one more time. With every step, I remembered the times we played together, the days spent farming for stupid glamour, the hours wasted wiping to ex-death, our plans for each new expansion, our hopes for what would happen in the story, and finally I find myself back at the campsite in Costa del Sol. It was empty now. A lonely fire by the ocean. I sat there alone, but if I closed my eyes, it was like she was still there. The Athlor that I had loved all those years ago. The Athlor I remembered playing in the water. No matter how much I wish for it, I can't go back. I could never have those moments again. I can't go home. All I'm left with are the familiar ghosts. Memories of a time long past and of a friendship long gone. As soon as I finished the MSQ, good that you went to finish the MSQ. <laughs> I'm still going to finish the MSQ though. <laughs> It was so dramatic. Up to long. I'm going to finish the MSQ though, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to skip that. I uninstalled Final Fantasy XIV again. There's no home for me there. Not anymore. I mean, you say that, but on April 12th, there is. That's all I'm going to say. Is like You feel like that now. But on April 12th, you might feel a little different. It's all I'm going to say. I'm just saying you might feel a little different. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> bit dramatic. <laughs> it's never nice losing a friend. We've all done it. Uh, most of us have done it anyway. We've lost a friend at some point or another. But uh, the, the clock keeps ticking. Remember that. The clock never stops. So you'll be all right. Scarab Lord Adventures. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, you might be being bullied here. <clears throat> well, after having met you IRL uh, just a week or so ago, <clears throat> we'll see how this one plays out, won't we, Mr. Lionheart? Uh, we'll see how this plays out. Okay, uh, Mike, this is from Bex. Okay, it's got a note. The guild name you will need for this has to include the word gorilla to make sense. All right, you've been set a challenge stream. Oh. Gorilla gang? Gorilla, not even gorilla pawn. <laughs> Gorilla glue, gorilla panic, gorilla ass, gorilla tape, golden gorillas, uh, gorilla nation, thriller gorillas, the gorilla waitress, silverbacks, gorilla queer, Clint Eastwood, you dickheads. You're not having gorilla pawn. Shut up, Jess. I'm not doing that. Gorilla war, gorilla braves. Uh, I think gorilla gang fits. The gorilla gang. Gorilla gang works. Oh my. Oh. Okay. This is written by Lionheart. Okie dokie. Are you sure you want to admit... Right, Bex, to be clear, whatever he's going to tell us in here will not reduce his um, credibility as... Is he naked? <laughs> he told me this in person and I asked him to send it in. Okay. Okay. All right, then. <laughs> here we go. Hello, Mike and chat. Today, I'm here to share with you my journey to Scarab Lord. Before you all knew me as the completely degenerate, naked catboy of Eorzea, I was living at home in Australia, and I was a holy paladin on the Oceanic Frostmourne server. Or more recently, a smock fury warrior named Lionheart. I reserved that name 30 minutes before a 14-hour flight in the middle of an airport on Oceanic. Okay. <laughs> I started WoW Classic on launch and left Battle for Azeroth behind without ever looking back, as even though I did play in vanilla, I never saw past the Molten Core. 
So anything past there up until the start of the Burning Crusade is technically brand new content for me. I always wanted to experience the original Fury Warrior with Wind Fury in action. I ended up uh, missing Alliance because I proc once tear aggro <laughs> and either end up becoming the tank myself or die. True. I had laid out a list of goals I wanted to achieve. Get the majority of tier 3, craft Thunder Fury, Blessed Blade of the Windseeker, and defeat Naxxramas Necropolis. I wish I could say I got all of those done. I never finished Thunder Fury. I did clear and farm Naxxramas and got most of my tier 3. In place of that sweet Thunder Fury though, I did get something I was not expecting. I managed to complete my Scepter of the Shifting Sands and bang that gong. And I did it completely by accident. How the fuck do you get Scarab Lord by accident? What? I also have one binding in, on my classic account. <laughs> I have another binding on my main account. You see, our guild wasn't originally planning to get a Scarab Lord. So we didn't prepare for it. I decided to pick up the starting quest for shits and giggles for something to do on the morning of the patch just to eventually do it for some nature resist or shadow resist items as well as get a cool sword and other stuff. All of which would be done well after the gates of Ankaraj had opened. By the time raid time rolled around and we were getting ready to go to Blackwing Lair, I had the quest only one may rise in my log to collect the head of Broodlord Lashlayer. Now, I assumed that a few of the folks in the guild also had that quest. They would have probably picked it up like me so that later down the line we could collect some easy shadow resist and nature resist gear. But that was not the case. And I was the one who would rise. We crushed through Blackwing Lair, clearing the suppression room, destroying the Broodlord. As expected, the head dropped. Somehow, <laughs> in the entire raid of 40 people... I was the only one who had the quest. Subsequently, I got this part done by default. And for those of you who don't know about the long, long journeys of Scarab Lord, if you didn't get the head of Broodlord in week one, the likelihood of you getting the scepter done in time was super low because of the amount of grinding required in the next step. Most guilds who had multiple Scarab Lords set up split raids or GDKP runs in order to get the head for themselves. After the raid, I went and handed in the quest and I got the next part. The Path of Righteousness. And the follow-up quest, the Hand of Righteousness. Carapace Fragments. Farming. Farming. They needed to be farmed from the various denizens of the hives in Silithus and handed in for rep to get to neutral with Nosdormu. This required 208 handins of 200 fragments per handin, totaling 41,600 diligent farming fragments. Do miss you, wow. <coughs> now, <laughs> in theory, in theory, this could be skipped by reaching neutral in the raid. You only need to collect 200 fragments to do the initial quest and then get the rep from the raid itself. But by that point, obviously the raid is open and no one can bang the gong. So for our FF14 viewers who are not clear with this, when the new raid came in classic, the raid called Arn Courage, it was sealed until a concerted war effort was done on the server to open the gates, which is the quest he's talking about now. You banged the gong, that then opened the gates, and the raid was then available. That's what he's, he's doing by accident. So let's add some context to this, though, because there seems to be a misconception that this grind would be easier than the original grind. For every 200 fragments you hand in, you could get a token which allows you to deputize another player. Correct. And they can collect fragments too. Okay, yes. So to be clear on this, whoever does the quest, they can kill these little beetles and get their fragments. But after a turn in, you can then pick somebody else who can then also do it. But only the people who have been deputized can collect these fragments. Fragments are tradable and sellable on the auction house. You must be deputized or on the quest in order to loot the fragments. This gets more complicated on a PvP mega server where some guilds were trying to get 10 plus Scarab Lords. All in all, I think our server ended up with 30 Scarab Lords. Now, there are three hives in the Silithus zone, all with these elite cockroaches. Ivashi to the north has bugs which drop one to two fragments each. These have the lowest health, but they have mobs that disarm you, so you can't hit them. Hive Zora to the west has bugs which don't do anything particularly nasty, except for some non-elites which all spit poison and roam in packs of five. The poison is lethal, so dropping one to two, three fragments per mob or a non-elite pack. 
Hi, Regal to the south, which has mobs which hit very hard. Some of them are in stealth. Some of them do mind control. Some give you disease. And these are the most lucrative, dropping one to five. Now, as our guild decided not to bother with the war effort, I didn't ask for any help in the beginning. I did get curious and decide to see what I could kill out there as a lonesome one-man fury warrior with no healer or dispeller. Of the three hives, Hive Regal was the easiest for me to solo, with Ashi being a close second with the disarm, and Zora was off-limits because the poison destroyed me every time I went there. Seems simple, right? Except for the fact that the entire zone on two layers was farmed to hell and back. My server was the most populated oceanic server, with, like I said before, some guilds trying to prepare 10 plus Scarab Lords. Deals were made, schedules were sorted between the Horde and Alliance superpowers, and they formed cartels. Each hive had a mixture of guilds or faction control at certain hours of the day. If you were still in the hive when the other faction turned up, you were farmed harder than the bugs. In a lot of cases, your own faction would be there, and if you entered their farming period, a strike team from the opposite faction would arrive and delete you because you were not allowed to play there. I did sneak in some kills, though. Even stealing tags from the casual horde guilds, farming groups as a little fury warrior. I made it onto some hate lists, but the way I see it, fuck them. <laughs> yes, dude. <laughs> but the way I see it is, fuck them. <laughs> I had the five head idea of farming the fragments and selling them. They were very lucrative, selling for three to four gold each and could farm about a hundred an hour on my own, provided the alliance didn't grief me. For some mindless killing, that's not bad when you factor in that these mobs are elite and drops lots of BOEs for disenchanting as well. I stockpiled them to sell in stacks of 200. When I had about 500 in my bags, some guildies started getting interested in the grind. I thought it might be a nice gesture to give some of these fragments to get deputy tokens so they could farm some gold as well. Why don't we all cash in on this idea, guys? Before I knew it, I had three deputies and we started joking. Maybe we can actually do this. So I started formulating plans. I mapped it all out and how it would work with our raid schedules. I worked out a route. Heck, I even made a spreadsheet. The way it worked out was our time limit was the reset before the gong would become active, which is a server-wide event. As we wouldn't have enough lockouts in our raid schedule to finish the scepter before the gong was hit. Fortunately, our server delayed handings, so I got about three weeks to finish it all. If I felt at some point that the effort would lead to failure, I would make the early call to sell all my fragments on the auction house and all gold would be distributed to the guild based on what people farmed. My profits would be low because all the fragments to deputize people were coming out of my pocket that I had farmed. But I made sure I set aside the fragments that everyone else farmed so they would at least get something if we didn't complete it. I did do something cheeky though. I started selling the deputy tokens to randoms, promising them so much cash if they just bothered to farm. I was selling them for 100 to 200 gold each, basically. Selling my own at 1G one one each while stockpiling gold to buy more if needed. This worked out because randoms wanted a deputy token so they could make some gold. Some folks were even nice enough to trade me a few handfuls when they learned I was going for the mount. As the days went on, I became what can only be described as the complete degenerate. On three consecutive days, I farmed cockroaches in Silithus for 20 hours. The only time I didn't stop farming was to do my scheduled raids. I slept for four hours. I would sneak in meals and showers where I could. All in all, I did this for almost two weeks. That's diligent farming. I could still... I had the same Spotify playlist jamming the entire time. I'd like to point out that to this day, I still memorize every single cave and the spawn points of all the bugs in those caves. I even memorized the farming spots of other guilds and times that the Alliance would rock up to kick us out the area. 
We also had cross-faction multi-boxers who would gank both factions just to create chaos. Lots of other random stuff happened that could only happen during an event like this. Like getting mind-controlled by an enemy in Hive Regal and wiping out your own team because the mob decides to use your big cooldowns and kill the healers instantly. But, during this grind, I was also pretty active on the Oceanic Classic Discord server. It was all bants. <laughs> shit talking mostly and i managed to build a bit of a rapport with some of the alliance players they were asking me how the grind was going and i explained that we weren't pushing too hard for it simultaneously playing 20 hours a day we didn't have a ton of dedicated farmers or any set time it was just people who would play and do it whenever and if we got it we got it you know it wasn't big deal nothing like that if we didn't i'll just sell the fragments for gold Lots of hoardy people even DM'd me to be the first in line to buy my stock so they wouldn't have to farm as much. Several of these alliance players, however, were in some of the more organized big boy guilds. The guilds that had organized to have certain parts of the zone dedicated to just them at certain schedules. Now, one guild called the Gorilla Gang loved to PvP, and they were going for a Scarab Lord themselves. Let me explain these guys to you. They were notorious for world PvP, ganking people while shouting gorilla only. <laughs> Using the cross-faction translator. Because I had a bit of rapport with them from chatting in Discord, they generally leave me alone in the world and I'd shout back gorilla love. Now during the Silithus grind, I'd notice at 8pm when the Horde were getting kicked out of Hive Regal, the Alliance would show no mercy. But as each day passed, I was getting killed less and less. In fact, I noticed commonly that I was the only Horde player not getting killed. And even folks from my guild were not getting touched now. Usually I would find a corner of Hyde Regal and do some diligent farming all day. And other Horde would sometimes encroach on my spawns when we controlled it. But when the Alliance turned up, they wiped out all my competition. And left us to just farm our little corner by ourselves. Provided we didn't come out of that corner, obviously, the Alliance were happy to give up a few spawns just to let us be. As it turns out, if you're nice to people, even those in the enemy, they're generally pretty nice back. The Alliance guilds were content to let us farm in our small little corner when they controlled the hive, and regularly helped us remove other horde and the multi-boxers who were ganking. I reached out to them, I thanked them on Discord, and all they did was send heart emojis back. It was extremely valuable having a consistent farming spot on one of the biggest PvP servers in the world during an extremely competitive grind. Sometimes when they wanted to have the hives themselves, I'd get charged by a warrior or sheeped by a mage, but they didn't kill me. And they would just emote no. I saluted them, packed it up, and went to sneakily farm somewhere else. <laughs> Sometimes when they were finished farming, they'd find me clean out the horde, and then give me a cheer as a sign to go back to my little spot and keep farming. After a grueling, diligent grind, I noticed the war effort was coming to a close. The clock had been ticking, time was nearly up, and I was still short 10,000 fragments. In the end, I ended up sinking a significant portion of my fortune and borrowed gold from others to buy the fragments. I had farmed so much. I had done so much that I was all in. I had to have it. It was go mode. With the carapace fragments done, now I had to go back and ensure the rest of the content was correctly mapped out. The next part of the chain splits off into three parts, red, green, and blue shards. I had to clear Blackwing Lair in a speed run, which was easy. The green scepter involved a cheeky run to Sunken Temple to pick up a quest, kill green dragons at each of the portals around the world. The drop rate on these was low, but we smashed them out pretty quickly. <laughs> there was a mini boss in Duskwood's Dragon Pole, which was vastly underestimated and killed us very quickly. Finally, there was the Aranicus encounter in Moonglade. I assembled armies from three separate guilds and coordinated them all while teaching them the cheesy strat for this fight, which involved using one of the buildings and lossing in Moonglade. This was challenging, but we got it completed. For all three of our would be Scarab Lords, one from each guild. The really fucky part, though, was the most obnoxious one the Blue Scepter Shard. You had to run all over the world. A trash drop from Molten Core with a low drop rate. Finding a way into a secret island. Getting an epic cooking recipe. Yeah, that was a good quest, that. Constructing a book which involved three major 40-man raids. Several outdoor raid bosses which included a deadly gnome, a mechanical gorilla, killing elite demons in Winterspring and Blasted Lands and invading the opposite faction's city. 
and finally crafting a special lore that involved a handful of Arcanite bars. When all was said and done, we had to summon a mighty fish boss in the middle of Ashara Bay who dropped over pretty quickly. While we were farming Molten Core Trash, we got the call at around 7pm from World Chat. The gong. The gong would be active in exactly seven days from now. I was only stressed about the green dragon fragments as we hadn't yet done those. I had heard about the terrible drop rate and for what I heard, one warlock in his guild didn't get the Hinterlands fragment because it just never dropped. We were farming at the same time and I got mine within an hour. Nice. <laughs> Approximately three days before the gong is active, I had it in my bags. The scepter of the shifting sands. I spent two days cleaning my degeneracy up. I'm not joking, it took me two days to remove all the McDonald's bags, empty KFC, and pizza boxes in my apartment. <laughs> two days of cleaning? There was so much when I looked around. It didn't help that I lived across the road from McDonald's and KFC at the time. Anytime not cleaning, I was sleeping. Eventually, though, it, this sounds like every World of Warcraft player who went for, like, High Warlord or Grand Marshal... Every time, eventually though, it was time. In my nice clean apartment, the gong was going to be active. And Blizzard actually did something cool. They had to layer our server into two for the event because of how many people were online. There was still a 6,000 person queue to be there for the opening of Ankaraj. And from what we could tell, if you had the scepter in your bag, you were visible to players on both layers but untargetable if you weren't on the same layer. So Horde and Alliance both picked a layer and stood there, while the whole time each faction could see two idiot would-be Scarab Lords, one from each faction spamming Gorilla Only and Gorilla Love at each other while waiting for the gong to become active. And when it did, I smashed the shit out of that gong. It wasn't the first one, sadly, so my name didn't get broadcast across the server, but I did smash it and I got my big buggy horse. While I never did finish Thunder Fury, this quest chain was the most fun two weeks I've ever had in World of Warcraft since Mage Towers. And it gave me far more in-depth classic experience than most players would ever receive. It made me lament the days when a whole world felt like it was alive and existed. This comes to the end of my little tale. It's not a mega juicy drama, just memes, epicness, and good fun along the way. The only drawback is, to this day, when a song from my grind playlist comes on. I get PTSD flashbacks to that hive and those caves. It was a hell of a journey. It reminds you all of the fun times in WoW. But for now, I will continue to grief you on stream with my naked catboy's ass. P.S. I've attached some screenshots. <coughs> oh, God, you're a female smock? Oh, murder, death, kill. Murder, death, kill. Ew. A female smock? Ruined. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Bang that gong, baby. Oh, you did make a spreadsheet. Holy shit, what a nerd. <laughs> what an absolute nerd. Fragments turned in, 41,600. Fragments in bags, zero. Did it. What a geek. You can't get them out without a spreadsheet. I think that's the last of the screenshots. You can't. You, only by accident, though. Yeah, I wasn't going for it. I promise, guys. It was all an accident. It was a total accident. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of drama for this week. I'm going to love you and leave you. But we should be back at some point. We have multiple things happening over the weekend that should be awesome for you guys. Uh, so wait and see on that one. We'll be around. But other than that... I'll see you Monday, my friends. I will see you Monday. And it is good to be home back in the Manchester. It is good to be home. Please have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And I will see you as soon as I possibly can. Be good, guys. Streamed this weekend. Uh, let's see what the boss says. Emma uh, called me three times during drama time. So I should probably call her back. See you later, everybody. Oh, a ball is in a bro fist to you all for Friday has landed on us once again. And that, of course, means it's time for some drama. It's time to sit back and celebrate the weird and wonderful world that exists in the internet superhighway with the creepiness and the weirdness and people using anonymity to be incredibly weird and interesting and fun and wholesome and terrible and terrifying and 
sexual and do all those kinds of weird and wonderful things. And if you want to send us a story, you can do to preachgaming at gmail, uh, drama at preachgaming.com. Sorry, drama at preachgaming.com. Or you can go to our website, preachgaming.com, uh, where you'll see every story we've ever told over the last seven or so years. All categorized and links for your favorite ones. You can make playlists. You can do all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things. It is a week of celebration. Uh, one indoor in-house artist, Mr. Chris, has had the best-selling display on all of display. He managed to achieve it with our wonderful Emmett Selk Amarot display that he made. It was the number one on the entire website. He has done tremendous things, and we're all incredibly proud of him. He's done super well. It's been a momentous occasion. Big claps to him and big claps to all you guys for supporting us uh, with the display stuff because it's super cool. And we love having these images in the background. You can kind of see them popped up behind me. You can see our wonderful Tataru one uh, based on Rosie the Riveter from back in the day doing all those wonderful things for the Scions. It's been an incredible week of also investigating all the weird and wonderful things that exist in the MMO side of Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, which I didn't know about because I basically played a single player RPG for the last 800 hours uh, besides some occasional group content. For the most part, we've been sort of following along with the story, but now we're delving deep into all these weird intricacies and I've discovered more things in the last four days than I could put my finger on. So stay tuned to YouTube for some more thoughtful commentary on that rather than, ooh, ah, this is amazing, uh, which generally happens with the stream. Now, curiously enough, as we get over to drama time, which is why most of you are here, for the first time ever, we have a story from Final Fantasy XI. Now, the only things I know about Final Fantasy XI are from research I did probably six years ago uh, because it had the most ludicrous and insane bosses in it. And I think two of them from Final Fantasy XI made it into a top five I made at the time, which was the top five worst raid bosses in history. Uh, I specifically remember the Pandemonium Warden, which caused players to get sick and ill uh, and all those kinds of things. I believe that was from Final Fantasy XI. And uh, you, if you, your de XP degraded, things like that. It was really weird. It was absolute virtue was on there as well. I remember that. Yeah, you, your exp your levels could just degrade over time uh, if you were playing the game and all that kind of stuff. It was, I, th I think that's the correct one. Absolute virtue for sure. Yeah, there was some really nasty old school style MMO stuff in there. Uh, so I don't know where we're going with this, but we... I'm down for a Final Fantasy XI story to learn about it. And of course, uh, I know most of our stories are Final Fantasy XIV and, Final Fan and World of Warcraft. Uh, but of course, we accept good stories from any weird and wonderful place on the internet. This is called The Manthra. The Manthra? The Manthra. Okay. I don't know whether that's a boss or a reference to something, but we'll find out together. Uh, no names required. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right, let's have some fun then. Hello, Preacher and your wonderful audience. Long time watcher, second time writer. I apologize in advance for any errors in the story. English is, uh, English is my first language. I'm just shit. Well, at least you're honest. <laughs> at least you're honest. I think that is the first time in all these years someone has made that joke. Typically, I do get genuine apologies because it's no problem if your English is not your native language. I understand that. Uh, but fair enough. I want to ask something, though. I actually genuinely need the jury. Oh, we haven't had one of these for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your gavels. Raise your gavels. The, the, the author is in need of assistance. Raise your gavels. Okay, Judge Preach is in the house. The gavel is here. Fair enough. Now, my mind is foggy on some of the really specific details, but... This is essentially how everything went down. I tried to warn the ones taken advantage of, and I profited from their stupidity. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Before the guilty spam, let us, let us hear the facts of the case. Yes? Let's hear the facts of the case. My tale takes place in the best MMO in the history of MMOs. Final Fantasy XI. Back in 2008, after the Wings of the Goddess expansion came out, I was around 16 years old. Ah, so you were young and mental. In Final Fantasy XI, you have different races, as you would expect, and some of them are gender-locked. 
I had been playing for a while as a Hume. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV here, male monk, uh, a human. <laughs> I convinced my best friend to start playing the game with me. I explained the different races to him and that different races have different stats, making some races preferable for different jobs and classes. Oh, that sounds terrible. So you couldn't just choose whatever you wanted? I'm glad that kind of thinking went away. I explained that the female gender-locked Mithra, which is the same as FF14's Makote, that is cat girls, I believe, had the highest dexterity stat and made them the ideal race for being a thief. This is what he ended up picking. His reasoning was both wanting to be a thief and not wanting to look at a male character all day. I can uh, empathize with that, yeah. I don't like looking at the muscular buttocks of a man all day. In Final Fantasy XI, we had a saying called Mantra because literally none of the Mithra players were women. So we start gaming together. I helped him with early leveling and some of the earlier missions in the game. Sometime after he started, I joined him in an experience party that had a paladin power leveling us. Ooh. <laughs> power leveling in FF11 was simply a max level character acting as the party healer while not in the party so you could have an additional DPS and kill everything quicker. Okay. So an outside the group healer. Understood. I didn't think much of this because a lot of people, especially in the lower level, zone, level, lower level zones, had an alt to handle healing to make things faster. A few days went past and I joined another group with him and noticed that the same paladin was leveling with us. This was a little odd this time around, because none of the other party members were the same, and I knew my friend didn't have an alt. So I asked, why is this guy still with us? My friend responds with the simple, simple answer, thinks I'm a girl. I told him that was dumb. There's no way anybody is a girl playing this MMO. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible. No one would be so stupid to think that a girl would play a game. That's crazy. That was mental. <clears throat> but maybe he was right. So I took advantage of it because the early levels in FF11 are a complete shit show. And having a max level character to bail us out makes it much more manageable. My friend continued to lead this paladin on. He encouraged what was going on. We played on Xbox 360. <laughs> and he added our paladin to the friends list. Can we not give a name to this paladin? There's not one down, so I'm going with Taiki. I'm going with Taiki. Taiki shall be our paladin friend. Sorry, Taiki. This might end up really bad. <laughs> this might end up really bad. I don't know. So we added Taiki to his friends list. He'd constantly join party with us, would Taiki. And he would always say that he didn't have a microphone. He went as far, my friend, this is, as setting up a female MySpace account. Whose pictures did you use? Ava Longoria? Daisy Ridley? What year was it? Who who was... Oh, it would have been Jennifer Aniston, I assume. In 2007? Who are you using in 2007? <laughs> it's, got, it's got to be Aniston or someone, isn't it? He went as far. Avril Lavigne would have been pretty big. Jennifer Lawrence is later than that. I don't think Lawrence would have been there. Halle Berry. Alba. Alba would have been 2007, for sure. He went as far as setting up a female MySpace account and used one of his friend's pictures to keep leading him on. At one point, I had an argument with my friend over this. It ended, it ended with me telling Taiki, look, mate, my friend is not a woman. It's a guy. But what I received in return shocked me. It wouldn't shock me now, because I've been on the internet longer. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> True. At this point, it would be the most... If I would be surprised. I don't think I'm, I'm shocked whether you get the most racist, ridiculous nonsense thrown at you. You're like, yeah, that seems about right. 
But for 2007 me, I was pretty shocked. He told me that I was just jealous. Oh, no. Taiki told me that I was just jealous of the connection that he had with my friend. After this, I never brought it up again. I made up with my friend and I thought, fuck it. And all was good in the world. So one day I'm out killing some smarks for experience when my friend found me and ran up to me with Taiki following. Taiki, who I was no longer on speaking terms with, casted Protect on me and then whispered me. Immediately, I knew from the whisper that my friend was playing on Taiki's paladin. Taiki had given my friend his password so that he could power level himself because of time zones. My friend had stalled FF11 on his parents' shitty desktop computer so he could multi-log. This is when we hatched a plan to take everything that Taiki had. And you're asking us if you're guilty? You're asking, you're really coming to this court? You're going to bring this humpy bumpy to my court and ask me to render justice? Gear in Final Fantasy XI is extremely valuable and very time-consuming to farm. A very low-level piece of gear could be best in slot through max level on the right class. As a result, some of the low-level pieces of gear are stupidly expensive. Taiki also played a Hume male, and there are race-gender-locked pieces of gear that, ha that he had, and I really, really wanted. So, together we picked a knight. Took an hour, and we took every single piece of tradable gear off Taiki and split it between ourselves, and then changed server. It worked out really well, because the server we were on was fairly dead, and I had already wanted to leave it anyway. We made new characters on the server we were transferring to with the same names, so it would force us, so it would force us to rename ourselves. Oh, smart. Smart. Yeah, I've done that in World of Warcraft. <laughs> I've done that in WoW. <laughs> and off we went. Yeah, I've done that in WoW as well. <laughs> it happens a lot. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a common trick. It's a common trick. Final Fantasy XI generally has very close-knit communities. It was actually a bit rough integrating into our new server, but eventually we both did. We both enjoyed our newfound wealth and continued to grind out the end game of Final Fantasy XI in our new Link show. That's really when what I thought would never happen again started to happen again. A very high-end player in the Link shell, a blue mage, started to take a liking to my friend. Okay, have you ever considered at this point that your friend is probably suggesting they're a girl from the get-go have you ever considered that's probably what's going on instead of being surprised that people randomly started to like your friend right just as an off guess maybe your friend is catfishing people it happens so often there's a name for it right so, who's going to be our mug this time? Ah, Braggart. Perfect. <clears throat> the cycle started again with Braggart. Adding to the MySpace. Dumb, flirty talking in party messages in the link shell. Braggart turned out to be into anime. And my friend started to add uwu to the end of most of his sentences. Uh... Uh... This time, I decided I'm not even going to try and hide it. I told Braggart straight up at the beginning that my friend was a mantra. Repeatedly. But he didn't buy it because of how feminine and delicious the conversations were. A guy wouldn't say that. <laughs> of course. 
A guy wouldn't say that. A guy wouldn't say those things. This has to be a beautiful lady who lives atop a mountain upon a pedestal with such soft skin and oh, I wish I could get outside. I didn't want to cause any drama because I actually really liked my link shell. It was nice. I was making so much more progress in it on the new server than I ever was in my old one. I also wanted to level up my blue mage, and having an experienced endgame blue mage like Braggart really helped. So, I did what I think was right, and just ignored all the flirtiness that was going on in my party chat. Brave. That's how I would describe you. Brave. Brave and true. It's just to ignore your friend flirting with a guy to steal from him. So brave. So brave. It was in an area called Quiffim Island, in a party grinding out experience on worms, where my friend ran up with Braggart following him. Like a fucking Twilight Zone episode, I got a whisper from Braggart indicating that it was my friend who was in control of that character. Yeah, it's really surprising that the trick that worked once and gave you loads of wealth, that he attempted to do it again. That is surprising. It turned out Braggart was kind of a burly man working on an oil rig, and when he was left for work, he was gone for over a month. He had given my friend the password to his account so he could power level himself and make his life easier. We did it again. Of course we did it again. We did the exact same thing as we did to Taiki. Except this time, I drove to my friend's house and we made a little party out of it. Now, I'm ashamed to say this, Preach. What? <laughs> this is so fucking lame. Okay. <laughs> I brought with me two fake plastic, champ plastic champagne glasses and a case of Mountain Dew. Gamer moment. Classy. It's classy, in a way. It's like the worst evil villain you've ever seen, all right? It was code red for anybody interested. I don't know what that is. We don't have that over here, I don't think. I don't think we have, U I don't think we have code red in the UK. It sounds very edgy, though. It sounds very serious. We, of course, took every penny Braggart had. And once again, we decided to move server. Now we had double the wealth. The only difference being that my friend also deleted Braggart's character when we'd finished. We forced the name change again and moved back to our original server. Why delete his character? I I mean, I think most of us have probably... Well, maybe not most of us, but I have given... I have loaned my account to a friend uh, during Vanilla World of Warcraft. And it was the first and only time I did it because, of course, they put me in Silithus with no Hearthstone and no armor. And I logged in and I was just like, this is well shit. Like, it's not funny. It's just shit. It's just really shit. And that was the first and last time I ever did that. That was it. That was the entire story from start to finish is they needed to farm something on my, on my priest. Or they needed my priest for something. And I was like, yeah, well, it is funny. It's not. It's just really annoying. I do keep tabs on the two guys. Uh, on FF11AH. Is that some sort of website? To see if they ever restarted. Taiki continued to play like normal after the incident. Braggart remade a character on a new server. At least someone using Braggart's name. But I come to you. But listen to me. Am I a scumbag? Before you answer... I did tell them. And also, while in an experienced party after all was said and done, I accidentally name dropped the original name of my friend while partied with people from the past, and he ended up quitting playing after he got blacklisted as the known scammer of the server. I took a break when my friend went, coming back when the server merged from a low population for a bit before ending up making a new character entirely. I want to show you what my characters look like. <laughs> okay. These are going to be gross, aren't they? These are going to be like FF11 characters. These are going to be bad. D do you have glam? Oh, no. It doesn't even show your character's glam. 
What a waste of time. <laughs> Why would I want to see you loot? <clears throat> I don't want to see you loot. <laughs> Garbage. Uh, I don't recall the final name we got with, but I ask again. I did warn them. I tried to tell them. Mike, am I a scumbag? 100%. 100%. Yo, look, yeah, you bumped into some naive naive people. What? What is it now? It's 2022. Like two decades ago almost. Right? You bumped into some naive people who were horny on the internet. That's shocking. But they didn't do anything. They weren't creepers. They did nothing weird. And you took everything. Twice. I forgive you, girl. <laughs> I broke up for gifts. It was probably their first MMO. It was the age of innocence. Right? It was the age of innocence back then. There was a lot of innocence flying around. We didn't know. This is before they blocked the pool with black afro characters in Haribo Country or whatever the fuck that game was. The pool was closed. This is long before the wave of people making cancer jokes and Hitler jokes and all sorts. This is the early days. It was the Wild West. You know what I mean? It was a long time ago. Innocence has gone for us all now. Innocence is gone. And you were part of the reason that innocence left behind was left behind. You're you're one of the you're one of the original toxic bastards. That's what you are. You're the like OG of being an asshole. Guilty. Guilty. <sighs> Sad. Now, I will gloss over that I am also one of the OGs of being an asshole. <laughs> I will gloss over that fact before anybody decides to bring it up. Uh, but also, teenagers, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, I was there. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. My exploits are well known. I have atoned for my sins since then. I have atoned for my sins. I, I believe that I have uh, I have done I have paid paid for my crimes over the years. Gravity breeze and Schmevin. Thank you. That wonderful website supporters. Thank you very much. Blow my banana. <laughs> Old oh one of the OGs. Speaking of OGs, blow my banana. I got the loot. I got the girl. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm going to do this before we do the the Lalafell story that's in here somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Hello, Preacher, and all your wonderful teammates, including the new puppy that you totally got after the race to world first. If I had a new puppy, you would have seen it by now. There is no new puppy in my life. I am the idiot monk that proposed via drama time. <laughs> you still got married, though, right? You did put. You did allow me to do the proposal for you on drama time, and you did get married. She was mad, apparently, but, you know... Still worked. And I back with a story about my uncle's comic shop and how it led me and Gravity Breeze getting together because one, it's hilarious. And two, the post office lost her anniversary present, so I'm using this as a way to make up to her. You fucking dumb bastard. Are you fucking for real? Oh my god. <laughs> 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 I don't know if this is a Chad move. I don't know about that, man. But this is a Chad move. Okay, everybody on best behavior, yeah? Shirts and collars done? All right, good. Post office definitely lost it. Mm. Hey, look, during the race to world first, I was a good husband and a good father is I bought all the Mother's Day stuff before I went to the race to world first so I didn't have to rush when I got back. And it was the hardest raid in history, and I missed Mother's Day. And I had to tell my wife that all her Mother's Day stuff was in my drawer at work. And uh, she wasn't happy. <coughs> she wasn't happy. <laughs> but I did do my due diligence, you know? I did my bit. I did my bit. Uh, so I assume Gravity Breeze is your wife-to-be. Okay. And you met in a comic book shop. Which comic? Kind of curious. Anyway, all right, focus up, guys. Remember, best behavior, best behavior. I remember the first time I met you, Gravity Breeze. 
in the shop because it was during my uncle's Friday Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic Tournament night. In exchange for allowing me to work for him at the ripe old age of 13, and by work I mean stock the new comic issues and the collectibles for things like Dungeons and Dragons, I would make sure to participate in the tournaments. And in the case of winning, I would essentially just take 50% of the retail price in cash, and he would resell the packs or special cards. And for those of you who don't know how bad this is, it could have cost him his ability to get stock for these tournaments along with other penalties if it was ever openly discussed and reported. <gasps> you can't win your own company's tournaments, dude. That's really bad. You can't enter those competitions if you work there. That's re that's really bad. That that's I'm, I'm not sure if it's against the law, but I think it is. Yeah, I don't think it's a case that they just wouldn't deal anymore. I think that's against the law. Employees aren't allowed. I, I don't think employees are allowed to enter the uh, company's tournaments. I think. So he's working at thirteen. Uh, I mean, I worked at thirteen. I worked at eleven. Her friend, blow my banana was in the Yu-Gi-Oh tournament and got to the finals with me where he won because fuck you, Blow My Banana and your bullshit Exodia. <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> I don't know about Yu-Gi-Oh. Gravity Breeze was watching and looking through stuff in the store and my first thought was, dang, this Blow My Banana has such a cute girlfriend. I went from the tables in the back to the PC behind the counter and pretended to be going over stuff in the system when she saw what I was really doing. I was leveling fishing in Zangamash. <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with that. She was excited because she had heard about World of Warcraft and she loved Warcraft 3. So I made what I considered at 13 to be the most giga chad move of my life. I offered to let her level my fishing while I went to look at comics. Oh no, my camera died. Wow. Time. Well, that's awkward, isn't it? Right, it's okay. Right, I'm just in the... It's okay for our audio listeners. I'm just in the invisible room for two minutes. All right? Chris, I need an emergency picture of me on drama time. Yeah, Chris, Chris will fix it. Don't worry. <laughs> it's going to be fine. <clears throat> this is what happens when you stream in a hot office all day. Chris is going to fix it. You just give it a hot second. I'm just going to audio. I'm going to serenade you audially. It's fine. So I let her take my spot fishing in Zangamash while I went back to sort new stock. Now I can reveal to you, my darling wife, what I was actually doing. I had to go and take a shit. But I wasn't going to tell you that. And she sat there, happy, just leveling my fishing. Time went by, and Blow My Banana and Gravity Breeze had become regulars at the comic store, and Gildy's with her on her priest, and Blow My Banana on his rogue. We hung out regularly, and while me and Gravity Breeze had been on dates, we weren't dating. It was around, what? We'd been on dates and weren't dating. Loser. It was around my 18th birthday when she started to date someone else. Oh, you were in the friend zone. Yeah, you didn't go out on dates. What you actually did, in her eyes, was go out with friends. That's what actually happened. Because then she started dating some other guy with a thick, juicy cock. And you just had, you were just like, and then she was telling you all about the problems that she was having with him. And that's, that's a bummer. <laughs> That's a real bummer. Around my 18th birthday, she started dating a guy called Schmevin, who for the most part was one of those wannabe skater bros that literally nobody believed when he said he was Tony Hawk's nephew because both his parents were only children. Oh, okay. All right, you got... Well, to be fair, dude, right? To be fair, you got outplayed by a skater boy, all right? You got outplayed by a skater boy. So, I mean, she dated guys before. Oh, this is sad. 
She had dated guys before and it always kind of annoyed me because I liked her. And from what I could see, they were always assholes about her hanging out with me in public. With, uh, with bo me, hanging out with me in public with Blow My Banana. She started playing World of Warcraft less. And that sucked because she was our guild's second best healer. Since Blow My Banana's girlfriend had the Lego mace and shammy healing was nice. So if Blow My Banana has another girlfriend? Oh my god. <laughs> she would still come by the shop, so there's still a chance. And almost every time she brought that prick Schmevin with her. He would just try and get her to leave because he didn't like nerdy shit. And I would always have a comeback whenever he tried to insult me with nerd jokes or whatever he saw as witty. And then I had to apologize to Gravity Breeze because it came across like I was being a little bitch about them. Oh no, dude. This is tragic. I know you marry her in the end, but this is sad. Right? <laughs> Uh, can you move the picture, Chris? Yeah. Come on. Ooh, there we go. We're fine. We're back. There we go. <laughs> this is a sad story. Stick with it. The Lich, Tings, Lich King's time had come, and so had Schmevin's. With Ice Crown Citadel opening, the team went full on farming mats and getting alts ready for 10 and 25 man with Gravity Breeze finding a new drive because she really, really wanted to kill Arthas. All of this meant that she was going to be playing WoW more and Schmevin wasn't happy about her talking to other guys online. So often, and instead of sitting at the skate park watching him go up and down the ramp... <laughs> Where the most complicated trick he would do was an ollie. <laughs> oh, you really have it in for this guy? This is so mean. One day, while I was putting out a few sets of the Warcraft trading card game, that only really sold when we traveled for card conventions because of loot cards, in she walked. Gravity Breeze came in and went in the back to get ready for our Dungeons & Dragons game, waiting for the others to show up. I could see she was upset. But I had a job to do. And I already knew that the problem was because of Blow My Banana. You see, Schmevin, being the wonderful skater guy that he was, had been caught texting some other girl. And she had seen that he had sent her a dick pic. Now, this isn't bitterness talking. But I saw the dick pic. And it was like if you took two Tic Tacs and lined them up and then ate one of the Tic Tacs. No, no, yeah, I mean. So you're saying you're telling this story to make up for your lack of anniversary gift for your wife. And I want you to turn, hey, she's listening now. Hello. Big dick though, didn't he? Like a rocket, like a fucking rocket, right? You remember? Like a rocket. <laughs> it was unreal. Some real don't put me in this position don't put me in this position while you're explaining your friend's dick pic to me gravity breeze found out and told him to fuck off <laughs> and he blamed her saying how she was the cheater oh he projected what a dude he said it was how could he not have sent those pictures that she was the cheater because he knew that she was fucking both me and blow my banana and was the comic book nerd's whore. I guarantee you that's not the case. That's not the case. Is there... I imagine there is comic store groupies, but I don't feel that's happening. Schmevin actually came in a bit later and was pretty upset. Asking me, where is Gravity Breeze? I told him she was in the back and asked what was up. Because I was at work and had to pretend to be able to tolerate him and be polite. He just said, it's none of your business, nerd. Which was technically true, so I just went back and back it back to it. Until I heard screaming and a big bang like something had fallen over. I ran back to see what happened, and the two of them were arguing with a Batman display knocked over. <gasps> Keaton? It would have been Keaton, right? Not Clooney. Was it Clooney? It was probably Clooney. 2007? Probably Clooney. Gravity Breeze didn't want Schmevin there and he didn't want her there. 
I told them both to relax because there were other customers and they needed to take it outside or get out. Gravity Breeze apologized and was visibly embarrassed, but just went back to helping Blow My Banana set up the Dungeons & Dragons game. Shmevan, however, was apparently not done and said he wasn't leaving without her. Preach at this point. Oh, is this a flex? All right. Preach. At this point, I was six deuce, 265 pounds, and thick. Where I looked fat in my baggy clothes, but I would carry 100 pound boxes up and down stairs for five hours a day, five days a week for the store, while Schmevin was a bit more built, which is why he likes to try being intimidating. Oh, it's, a, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a fight. I told him she wasn't leaving with him. He needed to get out of the store before I called the cops because they had destroyed our Batman property. I can't remember what he said, but I do remember he took a step closer and did the whole tough guy thing of pushing me with his chest. <laughs> it's important to note that I was at work. This was my uncle's shop. This was my job. I might have wanted to get into fisticuffs, but I had to think about the shop, so I just asked one of the regulars to call the cops and went back to stand between him and the small, like half the doorway that went towards the area where the tables were. I expected him to just walk away like a smart man because I don't like fighting, and uh, honestly... I'm a bit of a pip, a bit of a wimp. Aren't we all? We're all big until someone throws a fist at us. Well, he was not a smart man. And he punched me in the face. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he just punched me in the face. Son of a bitch. Uh, he said something smart ass. And I just did what every fighter does who doesn't know how to fight. And I grabbed him and we just kind of rolled her over, knocking chairs over. I got him on his stomach and held his arms until the cops came and he was charged with assault and trespassing while he tried to say I assaulted him, but thankfully I had witnesses. It cost him $500 dues for destroying the Batman display. Oh, it's bail. $500 dues? That's a bail. That's a bail. Dungeons and Dragons. It was actually fun that night. And pretty soon we reached heroic 25 on Arthas a few weeks later. And we got stuck on him for a bit. I had died constantly on most pulls because I would pull threat as a paladin or just be generally shit at the game. Gravity Breeze had told me off. Had told me. Gravity Breeze told me that if we killed Arthas that night and I played well, she would give me a beach. Nice. Not only that, she would take me out to Bogey Steakhouse. What is Bogey Steakhouse? Which one's better? The beach or the steakhouse? Checking. Checking. Oh, I don't know, dudes. The steakhouse looks really good. It looks pretty awesome. Look how happy this guy is. Check it. This looks really good. Uh, actually, wait a minute. What is that plate? Is he laughing at the size of his portion? Is this supposed to be an American steakhouse? You can't beat our meat. Okay, they've got a sense of humor. They've got a sense of humor. What's all the empty plates? Hang on, this place looks like a scam, actually. He's laughing at the prices because <laughs> he's not paying for it. His dad took him. I don't know. Bogey Steakhouse looks kind of scam, actually. <clears throat> I kind of laughed because it was her, and we only ever saw movies. Oh, that's how she made a play, because your dumb ass didn't know how to make a move. She is eventually just straight up resorted to saying, I will suck your fucking dick, because you didn't know how to make a goddamn move. Oh, this is so sad. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> I want to know. I would love Gravity Breeze, if you're listening to this... Happy anniversary. Um, I need to know how many signals you sent this guy. I can imagine it was like the bat signal, right? And he still couldn't see it. I have to imagine it was pretty much the bat signal. To the point where you resort to like, I will literally suck your dick if we kill Arthas. Hint, hint. And I will take you for dinner. And you're like, <laughs> funny. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> 
Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, actually dodging IRL. Still unclear? I don't know. I don't know. It could be anything. It could be anything. <laughs> well, we killed him that night. With a total pull count of 80. And surprisingly, I survived. <sighs> I, managed, I got a roll uh, on Invincible uh, with 100 after both me and Blow My Banana were tied with DKP. Oh, she played you like a fiddle. Gravity Breeze took me to Bogey Steak House and I had to pay. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got him oh did you marry my wife what a maneuver oh i love it that is a play that is a play gravity breeze and i had our first date which cost me 50 dollars because gravity breeze taught me into paying but i would definitely do it again <laughs> did you get a beach though you've left us i don't know if we did we never find out. We don't know if the blowjob was real either. <sighs> we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. It's not here. I'm sorry. There's, there's no evidence. To this day, I work full time at that comic store. And we even have things like Hearthstone tournaments via laptops. And now the new Metaz MetaZoo card game. I almost have her convinced to let me name our first child Preach. No. I do not consent. I do not consent. I do not consent. I, let's be clear on this. I don't like the name Preach. Okay? And you could check back. About five years ago, I tried to stop being called Preach. I just wanted to be Mike. And they wouldn't let me. They didn't like it. They got very angry about it. Today, I accept it. I've moved on since then. I've moved on. I've moved on. But, yeah. <laughs> let's not go there. Why are you even... Um, yeah, you know. I almost have her convinced to let me name our first child Preach, but the current cost would be my testicles, so I'll have to settle with her choices. No, it's not that it's not Preach or her choices, right? This is this is entirely mm. <clears throat> Have better options. Right? We argued about kids' names for like eight months. You know what Emma wanted to call our kid? Like Gregory. Now there's nothing wrong with Gregory. Well, I'm not having a Gregory. That's not going to work. Right? Oh, Ethan. Ethan was up there. All these things. E Gregory, Ethan. I think she said Hugh at one point. No, not Greg's. Yeah, you, okay. Not Greg's. <laughs> and that's the end. That's that. Which part of this is the anniversary gift to your wife? Your story is your wife was banging another guy. And you didn't recognize the signs forever. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary from all of us here at Preach Game. <laughs> I'm not sure which bit's the anniversary. <laughs> it's a good tale, though. Hey, you fought. You fought. You are definitely... Can we get an update on the beach situation? We need to know. Right? I mean, she made you pay for dinner. Did you blow her? Which is fine. Jiffy. And Cooksey. Did they all fit in? Yeah. Nailed it. Ooh, yeah. Okay, our final story for today. Oh, God. <sighs> Still waiting. <laughs> Still, is this him reminding her? <laughs> oh, I love that. They used this story to remind her. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you still owe me that beach. Oh. oh, no. What did I do? Yikes. Troll Z. Oh, you son of a... God damn it. Nailed it. Fixed. We're all good. There we go. Uh, okay, the Lalafell painting. <clears throat> Dear Preacher and your wonderful, wonderful chat. Oh, you're buttering it up. 
I am a WoW refugee. Blessed be the trolley. I started my journey in Final Fantasy XIV in 2015 when a friend that I had known from the old days of AOL RP, I promise you nothing dirty, talked me into giving it a try. At the time, I was pretty in invested in World of Warcraft, and I won't lie to you, I play both WoW and FF14 to this day because I love both and honestly, usually avoid trying to let myself be divided between the two games that I love for different reasons. Good, play whatever you want, man. My so my tale does technically start in the world of Warcraft. Kitchen Appliance is a friend of mine. And the two of us met while doing M Plus together back in Legion. Up until Legion, I mostly just quested and farmed in WoW. And it wasn't until Legion that I got my feet wet with raiding. Developed a taste for Puh Puh And started to push some big fat keys. I was a noob back then. But Kitchen Appliance was patient in helping teach me. And I often followed his lead when it came to fighting guilds. We got sick of Battle for Azeroth very quickly. We hated navigating Dazzler and Law, and so we made the choice to faction change. Ooh. Oh, you went Alliance? <laughs> That's not the solution. That's not the solution. We moved servers, found what we thought was a good guild, but we constantly had headaches because the guild leader's IRL friend and the main tank for the guild would just randomly go AFK during the raid and trash and boss fights to answer the door for his weed man. I don't like that. Oh, I don't like that. That's actually a really good usage of that door though, Chris. <laughs> That's a really good usage of that door. We ended up choosing to leave that guild. And while there was drama, it wasn't really that bad. And we walked away with two new friends, Salise and Cooksey. The four of us quickly started our own guild, which is, of course, the beginning of many a drama time. And as you know, during the middle of an expansion, it didn't go well. It was mostly just the four of us. Me, a fire mage, Kipchin, appliance, a priest, Yahalan, a warrior, and Salise, a demon hunter. We always needed one more person to do groups with, and eventually, Yahalan met someone named Aristai. He came as a package deal with his wife, Jithi. Cute little Vulpira hunter. Now there's six of you. This doesn't work either. This is a terrible deal. You've gone from four to needing one to getting six. This is terrible. This is, um, this is ultimately awful. Up until this point, I'd been the only girl in the circle. Not for lack of trying. Throughout our time playing, we had many girls come and go, usually chased off by feeling, uh, by feeling like kitchen appliance mansplained, or because they were put off by the constant and very loud belching that Salise often did in voice. So I was really excited that there was going to be another girl in the group. But she didn't want to talk to me. I don't know why. But I kept getting the cold shoulder. If I talked, she'd talk over me to, uh, to the guys. Or talked around me. Avoiding answering me directly. It was really weird. I'd bring up concerns to Yahalan and he'd tell me I was crazy. <laughs> and then you got gaslit. But Kitchen Appliance saw it. And he didn't understand why she'd act that way around me when the two of us had never really even had any negative interactions or anything. Eventually, I started to notice that I was being left out. A lot. When it came to doing content in favor of her replacing me. She wasn't any better or worse than I was, but I'd been demoted, in a sense, to the bench until she wasn't online anymore. Then suddenly... Oh, I was getting group invites. Part of the problem I'm going to guess here is that she's a package deal. And you need five. And I bet he won't go unless she gets to go. So she has priority. I don't know why you're getting skipped though and not someone else. But this is the problem now. You've got six. Right? You've got six in your little group. But one of them has to play with the other one. Hmm. <laughs> and for whatever reason, she doesn't like you. I just sort of dealt with it. I didn't have anyone else on WoW at the time that I played with, and I didn't want to complain and look like I was just upset because I wasn't the only girl in the group anymore, because really, I wanted more girls in the group. 
I'd been so looking forward to having another girl joining and was kind of deflated when one did and wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. I was kind of getting used to our new little dynamic when Kitchen Appliance approached me about FF14. I loved FF14. I had loved our time there when we first played. And honestly, the reason I had ever even stopped playing was because we'd gotten so focused on WoW and pushing in BFA. Of course I said yes. Of course. We brought it up to Selyse and Yahalan, who were on board with the idea. Shadowbringers had just come out and we were getting really bored with Battle for Azeroth. Ooh, Shadowbringers are BFA. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Which one? So we decided to give it a try. Jithy had no opinion, one way or the other, and went where Aristai went. He was a little Harris hesitant at first, at first not thinking he'd give it a try, but then when everybody was going, he agreed. He bought both himself and Jithy boosts and skips. Guilty? Yeah, that's 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 the guilty emote right there. I swear to you, Preach, and I swear to you, audience, me and Kitchen Appliance begged them not to do this. But we also didn't want to push because perhaps they wouldn't enjoy the story. And we understood that we were going to be playing Shadowbringers and he probably wanted to get into Shadowbringers content as soon as possible, right? Where would you join? Did you boost? I need to ask the FF14 dudes. If you were... If Shadowbringers just comes out and you buy a boost... Does it take you just to the beginning of Shadowbringers so you just end up in the first and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh god, that's gotta be the most bullshit start to a video game. <laughs> that's gotta be awful. <laughs> Didn't even get to throw wide the gates, man. Feels bad. Just end up like, oh, okay. <laughs> For a while, it was good. We quested and leveled. We did Palace of the Dead, ran dungeons together. This time I didn't get set out quite as often because on 14, a main, I main a white mage. I was the healer. Things with Jiffy though didn't improve. Though I tried still. Eventually we decided we would make our own free company. No one wanted to lead it. And since I had run the one kitchen appliance and I had on another server, I started the free company. What surprised me was that once I did, Celise started to get a little chilly with me. He started calling out questioning choices I made. Little ones, you know, nothing big. Things like the free company message of the day wasn't exactly what he liked. I ignored it. He was generally a pretty grouchy dude anyway, so I just let it go. I don't like to fight with people and I'm pretty bad at rolling over way too often. So we progressed. Kitchen Appliance and I saved up our money together and we combined it with the intent to buy ourselves a free company house. We decided we'd make it like a guild hall with a bar in the basement for some RP fun. Kitchen Appliance and I tried really hard to adapt and submerge ourselves in the casual aspects of FF14, the relaxed, light-hearted side. Selyse, Yahalan, Aristide, and Jithy were not really into that stuff. We never forced it or made it mandatory to engage in any of that, and most of the time, Yahalan would vanish for days on end, Selyse would complain, and Aristide and Jithy would just do their own thing. Eventually, they'd come off and on, but you could never see what they were doing in Discord. One night, we noticed that a small house went up for sale. It was perfect, guys. It was near a board, everything. Kitchen Appliance and I right away set up and started our clicks. When he had to nap, I'd tap him. Salise at one point even helped out with standing and clicking when I had to sleep for a little bit. Almost 24 hours. Everyone else had gone to bed, except for me. I held the line. And I clicked, and I clicked, and I clicked, and I got that motherfucking house. I stood and casually chatted with the other person who was bidding against me. She congratulated me and went on her way. And then I logged off after setting up the basics so that Kitchen Appliance and the others could see the house in the morning. 
kitchen appliance got on first. He right away handled getting the stables up. It wasn't long after that Solis got on. Right away when I logged on, message me. Why is there a chocobo in that stable? Can I not use it? Is this how it's going to be? Confused, I told him I didn't set the stable up, but I'd have a look at it. I did. I let him know how to properly use it, and we went on our way. It was just a matter of him not understanding how it worked, that's all. We set it up perfect with color scheme, benches, desks, vendors. But we thought... Oh, God, it's gone again. This room's too fucking hot. There you go. You're about to fire. My room's too hot. <laughs> we got it, we got it. A few days later. Oh, I did let him know to properly use it and it was fine, right? Mistakes happen. You gotta remember, our guy is still semi-new to the game. So I just let it go. A few days later, Kitchen and I, Pliance and I are spending a lot of guilds to buy and craft decorations for the guild hall. We set it up, we had the desk, the vendors, but we thought it is missing something, you know? And it was the walls. It was the walls. They needed something. Kitchen Appliance suggested portraits of important figures in the game lore. Leaders, etc. So we set about finding them and then strategically placed them all over the walls. Perfectly aligned by the pixel with the benches. Kitchen appliance hung most of them, including a beautiful portrait of our one and only Nanamo. We were so proud. And I genuinely mean that from the bottom of my heart. I was so proud of how that house came out. The hall looked amazing. And the downstairs was chill. It was fun. It was perfect for some role play. But then the trouble came. Salise and Aristai came in to check out this new house that we'd bought. Aristai was quiet, which was unusual because he usually always had some things to say. Salise, however, exploded. The fuck is this, mate? Why have you got some shitty Lalafels on the wall? You should put this in your room, not in the guild hall. I don't want to look like some pedo when people come in. We should all have a say in how this place is decorated, right? We should all have a say... It's a free company house, not your house, is it? And I don't want to see some fucking kids pasted all over the walls, you know what I mean? I was dumbfounded. We can't really give everyone a say. It's a tiny house. The compromise, I thought, was that we made it a hall and a bar to share in and everyone could decorate their own rooms how they wanted. We tried to avoid leading towards personal preferences specifically to make this somewhere for everybody in the free company to enjoy. But Solis kept raging as I tried to explain this. He was yelling at me in Discord, take down that stupid faced Lalafell. And eventually, I exploded. It's not fucking coming down. Shut the fuck up. There was a quiet for a minute in the server. And then finally Salise responded with, I'm older than you, mate. You ain't talking to me like that, mate. No, you're not. I am older. I am an older person, IRL. <laughs> we continued to argue over this stupid picture of Nanamo until finally we both left voice comms in rage. And then, bizarrely, bizarrely, I got a whisper in-game from Aristai, who hadn't said anything during this entire rage moment. I quite like the picture. <laughs> How helpful. That is super helpful. I quite like the picture. <laughs> How useful. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, good for you. I quite like the picture. <laughs> Aristai, who had never really talked to me one-on-one -on -one ever in history, appeared to be on my side. I'm not sure what he was after, if he thought I'd gossip with him, but I didn't carry on that conversation for long. If this is how he decided to make his first combo with me, I'm not buying it. I was upset, and I wanted to log off before I said something in my irritation that I didn't mean. We left it for a few days. 
Salisa and I spoke in DMs on Discord. We both apologized to each other for exploding on one another, and I curiously asked him if Aristide had said anything to him. Salise said yes. Salise said Aristide whispered him that he didn't like the Lalafell picture. Strange. During all of this, I noticed Yahalan hadn't been on in a while. So I did what I thought was right. I opened. And forgive me, preacher. I opened Battle.net. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm probably gonna check out the new WoW expansion. There he was. He was in Mechagon. Grinding dailies. Confused, I noticed he had it set to hide what he was doing in Discord. I messaged him. Asking if he was going back to WoW for a bit. Yes. Aristai had asked him too. I said, cool. I'll come and do some runs with you if you want. I love FF14. I love WoW. But at the end, I just want to play with my friends. So I closed FF14. And I clicked log into WoW. When I logged in, though, I noticed something very odd. Yahalan had demoted me and kitchen appliance from officers to members. Why? I asked. There's only six of us in the guild. <laughs> he said, I had to. You haven't been online in a while. What are you talking about? We haven't been on because we've all been playing FF14. You never told anybody you were going to be playing WoW again. He had nothing to say in response to this. And considering this guild was comprised of just us, I shouldn't have been upset, and yet I was. It was just such a strange thing to do. Because I also noticed that Aristai, who was a member, had been promoted to officer. And I wish I could say to you all that I didn't have a knee-jerk reaction, but I had a giant fucking knee, a giant fucking jerk, and a giant fucking reaction. I just G-quit. Fuck this. This is weird. I was tired. I was tired of being randomly left out. Tired of what... The, the, obviously, there were some weird fucking conversations happening behind my back. Weird conspiracies, maybe? And I wasn't going down that road. I was tired of trying to be friends with Aristide's wife, only to have her outright ignore me for some fucking reason. So I, unfriend, I unfriended all of them, except for Kitchen Appliance. And then I got a really bizarre DM in Discord from Aristide. He said, I don't, he told me he doesn't hate me as a person. But I AFK too often in game. Now, yes, I don't play 24-7. I do AFK sometimes. I have a bad back. I take care of my mother and animals. I never go AFK, AFK in keys or raids. My going AFK never does anything to anybody, other than for some reason, it annoys Aristai. Yahalan, as I mentioned earlier, goes missing for literally days at a time, but apparently that's okay. So, thinking back on it, I think it was just an excuse. So I just blocked him on Discord. <laughs> yes, fuck off. <laughs> Kitchen Appliance quit FF14 and WoW both because he was tired of MMOs, and I was basically just left by myself. Towards the end of Battle for Azeroth, Kitchen Appliance did eventually come back, and the two of us joined a new guild. He didn't like them, and all of that is a different drama story for a different day, but I did find my home with them. I liked them. I finally got to be with a bunch of girls and a group of people who made me feel like they enjoyed me being around. Thumbs up. They even put up with bad dad jokes that I crack from time to time. Ooh, thumbs down. I still play FF14. I'm not as active as there as I am in WoW, and mostly I'm a casual. I found a free company through that that's also amazing when I play there, and I do enjoy my time with them. In the end, I do suspect that maybe Jithy didn't like that I was there, and that it's entirely possible her and Aristai conspired to push me out. Between the talking behind my back, the pulling people away, etc., it's hard to think otherwise. I wish we could have just been friends! But I have amazing friends, and a wonderful guild now full of people that I adore, and I guess I wouldn't have met them if it wasn't for all the horrible people. P.S. I am pushing keys and raid healing now on WoW. A lot more confident than I ever was before. 
The guild I'm in constantly builds me up and helps me when I need it, and I'm thankful to have found them. I hope you enjoy your journey in FF14. I just finished Endwalker a few months ago, and it was a wild ride. Endwalker been out that long? If you read my story, thank you for taking your time to read it. I hope you and your chat are having fun playing whatever games you guys enjoy playing. Four months? Like four months? Yeah, I'm not out that long. Thank you for your tale. And yes, don't get played by fucking idiots. The amount of drama stories I get, man. That are, I'm in a shitty guild and I stayed there for four years while getting treated like a piece of shit. <laughs> don't. Just fucking go. Cut the cord, man. Pull that rip cord. Free yourself. You can do it. You can get out of there. Run. Run for your life. Five months, actually. Okay. Nanamo destroyed the evil. I will take that, that Nanamo destroyed the evil, for sure. Fuck all that noise. <laughs> yeah, piss it off, man. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a good old day. A good old day, a good old long stream. I think we've been on for nine hours or so, and it is time to take my leave. I am a wedding all day tomorrow, uh, so there'll be nothing happening tomorrow, but maybe on Sunday, unless I'm uh, going to spend some time with my kids. But it's been a tremendous week. Next week, we have so much stuff to do. We have extremes. We have so many other areas to check out in FF14. We might destroy some chaos. It's got to be huge. It's got to be huge. So I hope to see you then. Be awesome, dudes. I'm going to say goodbye. And I'll see you at least on Monday. All right? Bye, everybody.